Welcome back, everybody. Good morning. And it is my pleasure, my extreme pleasure, to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. And I'm going to take this off. I am 10 feet away from anybody. And it feels like the outside here, right where I'm standing. So this is perfect. So it's just like outside. So um, Mr. Roker, first of all, welcome to Tahoe South, Lake Tahoe. And um, we just have to express our uh, our appreciation for the color that glasses that you wear. We think it's quite appropriate for Lake Tahoe and blue. Um, so we'd like to welcome you to our neck of the woods. And all of our meteorologists are, are really looking forward to your presentation. But more quickly, I'd like to introduce or read uh, his biography. As a host and weatherman of NBC's Today sh Show, along with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, I think I got that right, Al Roker has the undivided attention of the nation, over 30 million viewers per week. Every weekday morning as America prepares for school and work. Spanning more than 40 years on TV and 13, oh, he's got his orange glasses on. I told you about the orange glasses. It's actually glasses. coral. They're coral. <laughs> Al conducts interviews well, with celebrities and newsmakers around the world and does a wide variety of segments on every imaginable subject. Al also co-anchors the popular third hour of today, presenting lifestyle segments that touch all Americans. In addition to his on-air NBC duties, Al also hosts Off the Rails with Dylan Dreyer and Chanel Jones. Tuesdays on Today Radio on Sirius XM and Cold Cuts with Al Roker on Today.com and YouTube as part of the Today original series. Al is also an accomplished television producer. He is the owner and CEO of Al Roker Entertainment, Inc., creating a vast array of programs for cable, digital, social media, and home video. Notably, Al was the executive producer of the award-winning Coast Guard Alaska and Coast Guard Florida series for the Weather Channel, now currently airing nightly on Pluto TV. As a best-selling author, with 12 acclaimed books to his credit, Al's mystery novel, The Morning Show Murders, part of a three-book mystery fiction trilogy, is now a TV staple airing on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, starring Holly Robinson, Pete, and Rick Fox. Al's latest and 13th book is slated for release on June 2, 2020. You look so much better in person. True stories of absurdity and success is a humorous collection of essays based on lessons for living a happy life and achieving success through the power of saying yes. Al made his Broadway stage debut in Waitress the Musical to rave reviews in October 2018 at the Brooks Atkinson Theater in New York City, playing the part of Old Joe, the owner of Joe's Diner. He reprised this role in November 2019. Al lives in New York City with his wife, ABC correspondent Deborah Roberts, and has three kids. You can understand with a resume like this how fortunate we are to have him for just a little bit this morning. Mr. Roker, welcome to Lake Tahoe. Well, well thank, thank you very much. Uh, and, and th thank you for that uh, really tepid applause. That was nice. Thank you. Uh, it was um, very special. Okay, so the drinking has started early. Very good. Okay, so uh, just a little bit uh, about, and I like the panning of the room, it's very nice. It's uh, Everybody's socially distant. Some of you, most of you, it looks like you're wearing masks. That's very nice. Uh, I'm in my home, so uh, uh, I don't have to wear a mask, uh, which is nice. Uh, but uh, so I, uh, I was born uh, in Queens, New York, and uh, I'm going to uh, lay this out right off the bat. Uh, I really had no interest in being a broadcast meteorologist, I, I didn't. I didn't. In fact, I didn't want to be on TV. I, I wanted to work in television or in radio. I, I actually wanted to be a, a cartoonist, a comic strip artist, but my parents forbade me. They said, "No, no, you're not going to make any money doing that." So uh, uh, I went to SUNY Oswego, State University of New York at Oswego, well known for its two seasons, July Fourth and Winter. Uh, which is really nice. A lot of lake effect snow. Uh, but uh, even then, I wasn't thinking about weather. I wanted to be 
uh, in in television. Uh, I'm, it says I majored in communications. Well, back then they just called it radio and TV because that's all there was. Uh, and so uh, I, I did that. I had a uh, uh, there was a guy uh, that went to school with me. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, really didn't do much. A guy named uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, he went to SUNY Oswego for uh, about freshman and sophomore year, and then he left. And I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. Um, I had to take a, a, a science requirement, and a, a roommate of mine, or a, we we were six guys in a room. It was a college suite, three rooms, and uh, one of them was a, a meteorology major, and said, "Oh, you ought to take uh, intro to meteorology with this guy because uh, what happens is he tends to." Uh, bend his elbow a bit on Sunday night and then doesn't show up for class on Monday. I thought, that's my kind of science class. I'm ready. Uh, and actually, be right before that, I had taken an, an environmental studies class, although back then in the 70s, it was called ecology. Uh, but I, I took a couple of classes in meteorology and again, had no interest really in, in doing TV weather until the end of my sophomore year, my college uh, uh, department chairman, a guy named Lou O'Donnell, Dr. Louis B. O'Donnell, uh, the late great, uh, put me up for a weekend weather job in Syracuse, New York. At the time it was called WHEN-TV, now it's WTVH. And uh, uh, I was a sophomore. And, and I, like I said, I'd taken this meteorology class and basically they were expanding the weekend news. They were gonna actually do a six and 11 o'clock newscast for both Saturday and Sunday. And the news director, I said, hey, you got any kids up there who might be able to do TV weather because I'm not paying much. I can only really afford a college student or a drunk guy. Um, I was in college, so I guess I fit the bill. And uh, I, I did a tape at school. He brought it down for me. And I, I got the job doing weekend weather at the end of my uh, sophomore year in uh, in uh, Syracuse, New York, WHN, it was a CBS station. Went from there, uh, uh, I graduated and uh, six months later, I got a job in, uh, w in Washington, D.C. at the uh, now Fox station, WTTG. After two years there, I moved to Cleveland. I was back in Lake Effect Snow right there on uh, Lake Erie. Uh, worked there for five years. It was a great time. And then I got a weekend weather job at, uh, at the, uh, w WNBC. And uh, it, 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 that really, in a, in a sense, changed my life. Uh, my uh, just a second. My my weather producer was calling me, and I don't know if there was a reason for that. Let's find out. I'm just going to check the. Uh, well, I guess there's no uh, there's no chat, so I'm guessing everything's okay. Anyway, um, uh, but here's the thing. Um, I really didn't think I was going to be a a, a broadcast weather person. I, I don't call myself a meteorologist because I don't have a degree. Uh, I I have real world knowledge and. You know, over 40 years of doing this, but I do not have a degree. And I've, I've always been very clear about that. I've never called myself a meteorologist. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, I got to uh, follow in the footsteps of, uh, and at WNBC, Dr. Frank Field, uh, who was a legendary uh, broadcast meteorologist. And uh, while I was doing that, on, I was doing weekend weather, he left after six months and went to the CBS station, and I got the Monday through Friday. And a couple of years going into that, uh, I started filling in for Willard Scott on the Today Show. Uh, 1987, I started doing the weekend Today Show, the Sunday Today Show, and uh, still doing the 5, 6, and 11 o'clock newscast. So I was working six days a week. And uh, toward the end of that, in uh, 1995, Willard decided to semi-retire. And so for two years, I did the 5, 6 o'clock news and the Today Show. Um, and then finally, I did the, moved to the Today Show full time in uh, 1997, and uh, it's it's been a it's been a wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, gosh, 30 years now. Uh, also, during that time, NBC purchased the Weather Channel, and for six years, I did Wake Up with Al from five to seven a.m. Uh, on the Weather Channel. So I was on the air uh, for about two, uh, six years. Was on the air for live for five hours a day, which I thought, wow, that's that's a lot of me. I don't know if people want a lot of that, but uh, you know, there you have it. Uh, uh, and, and one of the things that uh, 
being on the Today Show allows you is that uh, uh, it lets you do other things. And I've always been uh, interested in writing. Uh, I, uh, uh, as I've mentioned by uh, Carol, I've written 13 books, um, including a couple of weather books, uh, Ruthless Tide about the Johnstown flood, uh, Storm of the Century about the Galveston uh, uh, hurricane, and uh, also an extreme weather book for kids. Besides that, I've written uh, two, cook, two cookbooks. I've written uh, several memoirs. I've written a book with my wife called Been There, Done That, um, and we're still married. And if you write a book with your wife, whew, there's only one book, so <laughs> it worked out. Um, and and uh, you know, what, what I've always been interested in is being interested in everything. And so when people in my book, my latest book, uh, You Look So Much Better in Person, True stories of absurdity and success. One of the things I talk about is saying yes. Don't say no. And uh, somebody, uh, my agent, uh, uh, William Morris, uh, there's they have a theater division, and one of the uh, agents called me and said, "Hey, the uh, producers of the play Waitress, the musical, would love for you to be in the play." And I thought, "Oh, you want me to be the monkey love interest, Doctor Palmer? No, they really want you to play Old Joe, which is." A little depressing. <laughs> Your character is named Old Joe. But that said, uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. I took voice lessons, so I, I had one song, and uh, you know it was it was one of those things that I will uh, I will never forget. Uh, it was I got to sing a song, and, and in fact, um, my old and and Joe sings this song to um, uh, the, the the waitress, and. Uh, and and it's he sees her as a as a almost like his daughter. And I have a daughter who's getting married in in June, and she asked me if I would sing the song to her. So um, it's uh, I, I'm getting even emotional thinking about it. So it's it's kind of exciting. Um, you know, we we tend to share a lot about our lives uh, on, on morning television. And uh, you know, I, I years ago about uh, in 2002, I had a had a gastric bypass. I was much bigger than I am now. I was at 340 pounds, and uh, now I'm around 190. Uh, but uh, I and I've had several joints replaced. I've had a shoulder, two shoulders, a knee, two knees actually, and a hip. And and we shared that. Uh, but recently, during the pandemic, after the, uh, when we started to come out, I had decided to go get a checkup, and uh, uh, my doctor said my prostate levels PSA was up and he said they're up significantly we should look at this carefully maybe it's just an, an aberration so come back in two weeks and he gave me some antibiotics and, and it was still up up on maybe a little bit more and after doing an MRI and a biopsy it uh, turned out I have prostate cancer and so uh, uh, there are many different ways to go about this surgery radiation I decided to do uh, uh, radiation and uh, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sorry. I decided to do surgery, had my uh, prostate removed, and uh, right now it looks good. Uh, we took out the lymph nodes, and uh, uh, didn't see anything, and looked like the kind of cancers uh, 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 contained to the prostate. So, I'm waiting for my next uh, uh, blood test, which is uh, I, I'm about to take that, and uh, if that comes back like below 0.5, that means my PS, my cancer for the moment is gone, but I'm going to have to get tested every six months for the next five years. And if it stays clear, then I get uh, tested once a year uh, for the rest of my life. But that's uh, a small price to pay. Uh, it's been a very exciting time in the last uh, several months with a change in administration. Um, science has taken from center. Uh, we have rejoined uh, the, the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, uh, we've rejoined the World Health Organization. Uh, that science is now back. Uh, uh, the climate uh, situation is being taken extremely seriously by this administration. Uh, when you have John Kerry kind of heading stuff up uh, for the administration, you know that that's a, a serious deal. And But even before that, even during these last four years, we've done a number of climate uh, stories. We, in fact, at NBC News, have a climate unit 
that uh, is expanding even as we speak. Uh, and and we we uh, did a uh, um, a trip to Greenland uh, where we have exp- we you know we really took a deep dive into what is going on with our climate. Uh, and, and we've got a, a little presentation here, and I think if I click this, it's going to run. You can take a little bit of a look. Greenland, a massive island at the top of the world and one of the most remote places on Earth. This breathtaking landscape is ground zero for climate change, where the Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere else on the planet. I traveled here to better understand what all these changes mean for us back home. Why should they care about what happens up here in Greenland? For us, Greenland is a bit of a canary in the coal mine. New York University professor David Holland invited me on board his icebreaker turned research vessel to see how his team is studying the rapidly melting glaciers. Is the rate of warming something you're looking at? So when we look out on the ocean here, it's very cold water, and that's the top several hundred feet are all coming from the Arctic Ocean and pouring southward. But surprisingly, water from the tropics, the Gulf Stream, is lying underneath all of this, and it's flowing towards that glacier and others, and when it hits them, it melts them like crazy. Our mission today, retrieve, then redeploy a device that's been taking daily measurements of the ocean's temperature, saltiness, and depth. The warmer water on the bottom from the tropics is what's leading to a lot of melting of the glacier. Um, So it's important to keep track of that layer and how warm it is and how thick it is. Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's up. Once we raise it from the deep, Data is removed and batteries checked. And once you download all the data, then what do you do with it? So once we get the data off of it, we can plot it. Warm water was detected, but the actual rise in temperature and its effect will take a year to analyze. It's time to resubmerge. Next, we take to the skies. with NASA's Oceans Melting Greenland mission, better known by the acronym OMG. Two, one, drop, drop, drop. Similar to the NYU team, scientists are deploying probes to measure the temperature and salt content of the water. Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels globally by 25 feet, which is an enormous amount. If that much sea level rise happened today, hundreds of millions of people around the world would be affected. We have clear signs of climate change where we're flying right now. Absolutely. We can see, especially in Greenland, the impact of the warming through the retreat of the glacier. The extent of ice melt here in Greenland will actually help determine just how high sea levels will rise. I ended my epic adventure on what's left of the Apasuyak Glacier with guide Nico Segreto. All this ice that's fallen off, it's been since we've gotten here. We've been hearing it and seeing it falling off. And it's going into the ocean. What happens? It's very important here, standing on ice, to realize that we are on the first step of a domino effect that then later we call climate change. So, uh, you know, when when you're there, uh, it, it really, and while we were there, we saw um, uh, some of the glacier calving, and you hear this sound, and you see what's going on, and, and you realize uh, this really is one of these places that uh, is the canary in the coal mine. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere else on the planet. Uh, Gulf Stream waters, as you heard, melting the glaciers from below. Uh, and the Greenland ice sheet is melting at an accelerating race, uh, rate. Uh, it lost 586 billion tons of ice in 2019, which, which really shatters all records. Uh, and the amount of the, the yearly uh, uh, ice loss 
think since 2003, we're talking about 250 billion, 259 billion tons. And, and in fact, you look at just two years ago, 2019, uh, even though this doesn't sound like a lot, uh, there was enough ice melt to raise global oceans by 0.01 inches. And, and that, just sea level rise of one centimeter can, can have uh, really, really uh, tough, tough con uh, consequences. So uh, we are watching this really uh, very closely. And, and as a lot of you probably know, uh, last year, June of last year, June 20th, uh, in Russia, 100.4 degree readings in we're, we're honest, we're honest. Uh 2019 was Alaska's hottest year. In July 2019, Alaska's hottest month. Greenland's ice sheet in, in 2019 in July set a record of 197 billion tons of water being added to the Atlantic Ocean. And in 2020, the uh, annual, semi-annual Arctic sea ice extent ties 2016 for uh, the smallest on record, how much ice there is. So, uh, and in fact, the five smallest Arctic extents have occurred in the last five years from 2016 to 2020. So uh, in, during the first six months, January to June, 2020, temperatures in Siberia, more than nine degrees warmer than average. I mean, that's crazy. The Bering Sea ice is at 53% of average. That's the lowest, fourth lowest in 43 years. And uh, the low temperature of 33 degrees in Utyavik in Alaska on October 22nd, 2020, is the, the latest in the season with an above average freezing low temperature on record. So, and we were there uh, last year and uh, uh, just watching, you know, the permafrost, uh, which is so much a part of that part of Alaska. They're the United States really first. Uh, climate refugees because the permafrost is, is softening so much that uh, close to, to the ocean edge, a number of towns have had to be relocated. They use the permafrost as kind of like their version of, of the freezers you know, that they, you know, they, they keep uh, you know, the, their annual hunt. They keep the, 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 the remains of that down there to keep it cold. Well, They've warmed the the permafrost is is melting at such a point that they they their their homes that are built on stilts that are built into the permafrost those are melting and their homes are having big problems and of course we all know about uh, this past hurricane season unprecedented uh, thirty one tropical cyclones tropical depressions and higher thirty name storms Artha we ran through the American alphabet and now then moved into the the uh, Greek alphabet with iota. 27 named storms were the earliest to form on record. Uh, 13 U.S. landfalls from 12 named storms. Uh, and Ada uh, had two landfalls in Florida, 13 hurricanes, six major hurricanes, and one Category 5 hurricane, Iota. Uh, and in fact, at 160 miles per hour, Iota became the strongest of the 2020 season and the latest Atlantic Category 5 hurricane on record. It's the first Greek alphabet named storm to reach a Category 5 intensity. And uh, we've had five straight years now with Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic. That's the first time that has happened. Uh, and, and as we continue to look at how climate has had an impact on this season, 10 total storms uh, rapidly intensified in 2020. And you know, that, I don't need to tell you it's an increase of 35 miles per hour in 24 hours. Hannah, Laura, Sally, Teddy, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, and Iota. Uh, and, and, and tropical cyclones are slowing down, and that's been producing increased storm surge and lo longer duration rain. So these, these storms are overperforming, causing massive flooding. A and the hurricanes are creating more extreme rain events. And, and there's no question that human activity, is leading to stronger and more uh, uh, frequent tropical cyclones. But the good news is, as we mentioned, uh, uh, this new administration, I think, is going to be better for climate. Uh, John Joe Biden uh, appointing John Kerry to be the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, a climate czar, which is the first time we've had a cabinet-level position that serves on the National Security Council. 
and, and uh, helps leading the administration to that fight for global change. Uh, and, and even though the Trump administration did all these rollbacks, uh, we're hoping that those can be reversed. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, we're now part of that again, uh, scrapping the Keystone uh, Pipeline uh, on day one of uh, President Biden's administration. Uh, and he's directing agencies, departments, reviewing and taking actions to address federal regulations, uh, which was interesting because in the previous administration, they were rolling all those back. So uh, I think it's it's really important. This is coming at a very important time. We we saw during the pandemic, and, and again, it was a horrible way to achieve this, but a 9% drop in, uh, in uh, uh, climate emissions greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, I think that's uh, something that's really important uh, because we can, we've seen we can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. And and if we do it in a sustained way and a proper way, and it's a way to create economic uh, uh, upsides, I think uh, we'll be looking at something that's uh, going to be a, a plus, a win-win, not only uh, not only from a climate standpoint, but from an economic standpoint as well. Uh, so I, I think that concludes our uh, planned uh, uh, portion of this. I'm going to open it up for anybody who's got any questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Al Roker. I am on behalf of the Lake Tahoe Visitors Authority. We really appreciate your time. And we're going to open up the floor to our panelists as, then, as well as Facebook Live. So. Um, friendly reminder, please come up here and name and affiliation so we know who's talking. So I'll open up the floor now. Thank you. You know, I got to be first, Al. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, Cantari, I, 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 how are you, my friend? I, hey, buddy. I miss you, and I'm glad you're doing better. Tell um, Stephanie I said hi. I will do that. I totally will do that. I, I told her I was coming out here, and you were, you were the keynote, so she was psyched. Um, I just want to ask you, you know, as a broadcaster, the change, this just takes five years, five to seven years, you know, when you were discussing climate then and how you're doing it now, uh, what has changed? Great seeing you now. Well, oh, you too, my friend. Good to see you. I, 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 some of my fondest memories are spending uh, hurricanes, <laughs> hurricane coverage with Jim Cantori. There was one point where we were actually holding on to each other for dear life. Uh, in New Orleans. Uh, it wasn't during a hurricane. We were just holding on to each other for your life. It's a very special, special relationship. Anyway, uh, you, you, the, what I find interesting is um, when we first started really doing a lot of climate coverage, um, people were concerned. Ma some management folks were concerned that, oh, people don't care about that. They don't want to hear about that. But what was interesting was the only people who said that were the folks, say, you know, who, who weren't clued in in management. And I, I got to say at NBC News, uh, they have, and I know it's the same at your place, Jim, uh, they have embraced it. They have said, I want you to, we want you to go full steam ahead, which is why we've been doing all this reporting on it. Uh, but what was interesting, I was curious to see what the reaction on social media would be. And it's been nothing but positive. People are tuned into this. I think it's the, the politicians who aren't and, and, and tend to, I think, impose their biases or problems or issues with climate coverage. The average person knows, the farmers know, uh, the folks who work, work in agriculture know, that work in science know that there is a change going on here. And so... Uh, I'm, you know, I've, I, I've been very fortunate that, you know, I've been able to work at places that say, you know, good, go for it, do it. And, uh, it's been a real pleasure and, and to see others come along for the ride is a very, uh, uh a very meaningful development. Okay, Mr. Rucker, um, two questions. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, I think that uh, most people aren't aware or may, or may be aware that you got a fist bump from uh, President Biden 
at the inauguration. You want to tell us a little bit about that? And I have another question after that. Okay, well, you know, it, uh, I, I've happened to, uh, back in 2013, during the inaugural of, uh, of uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden, uh, you know, I was, I'm on the parade route and I'm calling out to them and, and uh, I asked Mr. Uh, President Obama, how was he, he, how was he feeling? Gave me a thumbs up. I said, how do you, how do you like this weather? Because it was pretty cold. And he said, it's okay. It's all right. And gave me, he kept moving. And then uh, Vice President Biden came along. And I went, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President. And uh, to my shock, he runs over and shakes my hand. I'm like, what? Uh, uh, so that was, uh, that was pretty special. And, and that year, the inaugural fell on the same day as, as celebrating uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, for a, a chubby black kid from Queens, uh, to be acknowledged by the first black president and have the vice president of the United States come over and shake your hand uh, was mind-blowing. I was thinking my parents were both gone at that point. And I'm thinking, you know, wow, uh, that's, that's special. So uh, uh, we jump ahead to this inaugural, and uh, uh, everybody's like, well, maybe, maybe he'll come over. Maybe President Biden will come over. At that point now, the pressure's kind of on. I'm thinking, well, if he doesn't, now it's going to look pretty dumb. Uh, and uh, you know, he's walking up, and, and he's got the whole family, Dr. Biden and his kids and a couple of grandkids. And, Mr. President, Mr. President. And, uh, you know, he's he's almost like parallel with me. And he, I said, how you feeling? And he kind of waves to me, and I think, oh, that's it. He's going he's gonna to move on. And then all of a sudden he broke off and came over with fist bumps. Said, we got to keep doing this. I said, all right, Mr. President, you know, how are you feeling today? And he says, I'm feeling good. I said, all right, well, best of luck, and thank you, Dr. Biden. And, Kept going, so uh, that was uh, that was very special. It meant it meant a lot, and uh, he's been very supportive. Uh, called in a couple of times uh, when I've had some uh, some uh, health issues, and he's checked in on me. And uh, so I, I'm I'm not going to lie, I'm uh, I'm a fan. So there there you have it. Hey, uh, the other quick question, more serious. Um, maybe half of the country over the last four years, because of the uh, previous administration, believes that. Um, climate change is a hoax or something like that. And I was wondering if you have the feeling that uh, uh, at least uh, now that we'll be able to convince the other half of the country uh, that climate change is real. Well, I, I've seen, we've had some, uh, 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 some polling that shows 70% of the country now believes in climate change. Uh, I, I, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, separation, if you will, that, you know, there's, there's a far greater percentage that thinks the election was false as opposed to climate change being false. So I, 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 that gives me a lot of hope. I think people do, you know, wh whatever their political beliefs are, I think they do believe that climate change, the majority of them, the climate change is real. Hey, Al, it's Cheryl Nelson from Norfolk, Virginia. I have a question for you. I've traveled to the Arctic myself and did a climate change series. And it's interesting because when I was in Barrow, Alaska, the people, they're so passionate about their home, about where they live. And you were talking about the permafrost melting and how that's impacting their homes. And from your experience, what did the people seem to think about all of this? Because these people, in my mind, it doesn't seem like they want to leave, but did they tell you what they plan on doing and how it's affecting their lives? Well, you know, we were there in Utkiavik and, and uh, we, we talked with the folks there. We also uh, talked with the scientists who are doing uh, uh, a lot of research up there. But the, the, the folks who live there, who are, were born there, who have been there for generations, I mean, we, you know, the, you know still go out on the, the, uh, the traditional whale hunt. Um, you know, they, they see their way of life changing and they're, they're, they're somewhat helpless, you know, because there's really not much they can do. For example, you know, the, the whale, the bowhead whales, you know, that they go hunting. Now there are other uh, species of whales that are coming in that are uh, a little more aggressive and it, it affects the way, you know, and, you know, they have to go out on the ice 
and the ice is less stable. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult. And, and when we were there in Greenland, uh, the, the traditional dog sledding is going away because A, the ice is going away, and B, a lot of these folks can't afford to, to keep their dog sled teams. So, uh, you know, the, the way of life is changing, and, but they, they feel somewhat helpless about how they can, they can hold on to that way of life. Hi, Al. Kristen Samos with KCRA, the NBC affiliate out of Sacramento. And I think I'm the only person here who is not a meteorologist or a weather person at all. But I am based here in Tahoe, so inevitably I cover a lot of weather stories. And wanted to ask you, my question for you is, uh, this year, back in November, we got a first big storm, still red flag warning. And we did a story about the fact that one storm does not make wildfire danger disappear. Similarly, this week, we're finally getting a lot of snow here. And people tend to think in those times that drought is no longer an issue. What would you say just about the fact that even when we have this weather that is, that is in our minds good weather, there are still those big challenges that we need to keep in mind? Well, look, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, climate change means that, you, you know, you're, it, it's not like, okay, this is going to happen on, on schedule. It just means that you're more likely to have these extreme swings in weather. And, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing these massive swings from drought to, to you know, almost literally feast to famine or famine to feast where we have all this drought and then all of a sudden pattern changes and now you're getting inundated with heavy rain or snow. So um, I think people have got to realize, and, and out where you are, uh, you know, the idea of a fire season is now almost quaint because they're, it just seems to stretch year long. So I think what people have to realize is that they are going to be whipsawed by, by weather events uh, for the foreseeable future. We have a comment from our Facebook Live. So what is your thought on a comment made with the increase in construction and increase of roads, the blacktop and dark coloring of them absorbing heat from the sun? Do you think if we change roadways to white or concrete, would that help decrease or not? I, I don't I, look. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't do. I can't say that. Uh, that's not my my uh, field of expertise. If I have any field of expertise, but I I don't know that you know the, because for example, where I live in upstate New York, we have uh, concrete uh, roads. Uh, some of the the inner parts of the interstate are all are concrete. So I I don't know that that's going to have a, a major impact. All right, well, I think that concludes, unless we have any other last minute questions. Um, yes, okay, one second. <laughs> Hi, Al, how's it going? My name's Adam Epstein, I'm a meteorologist in Sacramento. How's it going? Hi, Adam. Good. Good. Uh, we you? met briefly once back in 2013, via Don Sunikas, he was giving me a tour of uh, ah. the studios. I was trying to convince him to give me an internship for a position that didn't exist. So it didn't end up working out that way, but I did work at WNBC that summer. This question is more of a career question for you. Uh, you've had a wonderful career, like you explained earlier. What would you give, or what advice would you give to a young meteorologist who one day wants your job? Oh, that's a little aggressive there. <laughs> one day, one day wants your job. Just coming, just coming out. Why don't, why don't you do this? Go after Cantore. <laughs> and then come in. He's but, in the but, too but much. Since, yeah, and, and by the way, if you've seen that video of Cantori taking out a guy trying to clown him, you wouldn't mess with Cantori. <laughs> Nobody messes with Cantori. Uh, but th that said, I, one of the things I would say is that um, uh, you, you need to be curious. Uh, you know, and it, it's great to have a specialty. But I think you should be curious about all things and, and read as much as possible. So that, and, and look, I, my, news, my first news director, God rest his soul, was a guy named Andy Brigham in Syracuse. And he told me, he was, listen, I want you to be an expert on a little bit of everything. And that meant, you know, so you're always reading, you're always taking stuff in. So that even if you're not 
even if you're doing weather or meteorology or climate, that you can do and talk about other things. Because look, fact of the matter is weather and climate impact almost every facet of our society. So you really need to know uh, a little bit, or should know a little bit of everything. And that, and, and if for no other reason, it just made you a more interesting person, I think. Uh, because if all you talk about, I, I don't know if any of you, how many of you have seen the Disney movie or the Pixar movie, Soul, that just came out with uh, Jamie Foxx as the lead who plays a, a jazz pianist. And, and in, in one of the scenes, uh, he's been taken, his body's been taken over by another soul. And he goes to his barber shop and, and he finds out all these different things about the barber. And he says, or he, he's, it, it's a little convoluted, but he says that his character says to the barber, I never knew this all about you. And he goes, well, you never asked. All you ever did was talk about jazz. So don't always just talk about weather. Talk about other stuff. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and give props to the people who support you. I am very fortunate. The only reason my, I feel our broadcast is as good as it is, is because, it's not because of me, it's because of the people who are behind me. Now you mentioned Don Sunikis, who's been at the Today Show as our off-camera meteorologist for more than 30 years. We have what I consider, outside of maybe the Weather Channel, the, the greatest collection of off-camera meteorologists and graphics people in broadcast television. Uh, we have a, a terrific uh, uh, senior producer in Aaron McGarry. We've got, as I mentioned, Dan Sneakers. We have a woman, Sherry Pugh. We've got uh, Catherine Prosev. We've got uh, uh, Stephen Strauss, who set all of this up. Uh, we've got Janessa, Janessa Webb. We've got Brittany Bohr. Uh, I, I know I'm forgetting something. But Brian Van Aken, who is this guy who makes my uh, WSI Max like he 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 knows this thing like nobody's business. So you you've got to get yourself a team. I write about this in in uh, uh, you look so much better in person. Nobody does this by themselves. You've got to assemble a team that uh, whether it's personally or professionally. Uh, but uh, uh, I I'm I'm just really very fortunate that I have an all star group in our climate unit who, who support me and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very blessed that way because, uh, you know, I come up with ideas and you can have all the ideas you want, but if you don't have anybody to implement them, uh, you're, you're only as good as, you know, the, the, the graphics and the, the concepts that you can come up with. So uh, uh, always make sure you take care of your team. And uh, I don't know if I got it. That answered your question or not, but that's all I got. Well, thank you very much, Al Roker. We really wish you could be here in person, so we'd like to invite you for next year for the 25th anniversary right. of Operation Sea Storm about this time, uh, late January, and we'll definitely keep you and your team apprised. Oh, very well. That, that's to... awfully nice. Yeah. So... And, and but I, I will only do it if I can only room with Cantori. Okay. Noted. You got that, Cantori. All right. No, All right. It's the, a deal. The last, the last hurricane. <laughs> Last hurricane we spent together, we did spoon, so it was very special. Oh. <laughs> well, Cantori does bring the snow, and it, as it is coming in today. Um, oh, he brings the, the thunder, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think his quote from the last time he was out here it was his best day on the mountain, or one of his best days working. And so look to up the ante for this coming week with all the snow. So. Thank you again to all that tuned in, and thank you for our meteorologists being here in person, physically distant and wearing masks. And on behalf of the Lake Tahoe Visitors Authority um, and here at the team at Hard Rock Inside Vinyl, we really appreciate your time and, and your presentation and your commentary. So thank you so much again, and we'd like to see you in person next year. You bet. Take care.